throughout human history, our ancestors have stared at the stars and wondered if we're alone. And we are now at a truly unique point in human history. Uh, we are currently developing instruments that will likely have the capabilities to, ans to definitively answer this question within our lifetime. But the universe is a big place. Uh, and so we have to understand what we're looking for and where to look for it. And this is where Jim Casting's research uh, really comes into play. So Jim's research uh, spans a dizzying array of topics, from explorations of the atmosphere of early Earth and Mars to characteristics of planets orbiting other stars. Jim did his bachelor's work at Harvard, where he gra graduated summa cum laude. Following this, he did his PhD work at University of Michigan in the Atmospheric Science Department. And since then, he's had a large array of prominent positions uh, and is currently the, disti the distinguished uh, faculty uh, professor at Penn State University in the United States. The list of awards that Jim has received is long and prestigious, uh, to name a few. Uh, he's currently the, the fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Geochemical Society, and the American Geophysical Union. He, he is a recipient of the Lennox Award for his work on early Mars, as well as the Oprah Award for invaluable contribution to the origins of life. And he's also the author of several books, including The Earth System and How to Find a Habitable Planet. Uh, and in addition uh, to the science, he's played a pivotal role in shaping the policy behind the science. Uh, he's served on and chaired, in fact, many, uh, many panels over the years that have laid the groundwork for the amazing science that he's able to talk to you about today. So in the scientific community, uh, Jim Casting is best known for his uh, seminal 1993 paper exploring habitable zones around a range of different stars. Though I'm sure he'll elucidate more uh, in more detail, the concept of the habitable zone uh, is ultimately tied to the ability of the planet to retain liquid water on the surface. Through this, though this concept was originally uh, introduced actually in the 1950s, uh, it was Jim's work in 1993 on the habitable zone that brought this concept into the modern era and applied it generally to the field of exoplanets. Almost all current estimates of boundaries in the habitable zones in the scientific community right now are based on Jim's continued work on climate models and calculations. So in the next decade, as we continue to search for habitable planets, um, Jim's research and his guidance is one of the fundamental contributions to our effort to finally answer the question, is the Earth rare? So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jim Casting. Th thank you, Ian, for the introduction. And thank you, Nils uh, and others, for the invite here to Abu Dhabi. I've never been to Abu Dhabi before, and I've never been to the Middle East before. So it's really a, a very new and interesting experience for me. I got a chance to see some of downtown Abu Dhabi yesterday, including the Grand Mosque, which has to be one of the most fabulous buildings in the entire world. So, you know, I'll go back with lots of pleasant memories of uh, my short visit here. Now, what I want to talk to you about is uh, you've already heard from Ian. I'm going to uh, talk about the, the official title is, Is the Earth Rare? And I put a subtitle on it, The Search for Life on Planets Around Other Stars. As you'll find out uh, as I give my talk, I'm not really an astronomer. I'm more of a planetary scientist slash Earth scientist. But I've been hanging around a lot with astronomers for the last 10 or 15 years. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, most, the, the thing that is most interesting to me scientifically in the entire world is this search for life on other planets. So I want to try to, you know, and without getting overly technical, I'm going to try to bring you through what uh, some of the recent developments are and what we hope to do in the future. So there's, there's three parts to the talk. Uh, I'm going to start talking about what is life and how can we look for it. You know, I go to a lot of origin of life meetings, and actually there's big discussions amongst biologists as to what life really is. So we'll try to get that out of the way first. Uh, then I'm going to spend a good part of the talk talking about NASA's Kepler mission, which some of you may have heard about. This is a space telescope that has been up for the last five or six years and has been looking for planets the size of the Earth, although it can't characterize those planets. And then finally, the last part of the talk uh, will be on the, what we can do in the future. And in fact, I'll get to part of that early in the talk because that's actually the most exciting point part, and that's how we will end up, we hope, looking for life. Let, let me start out with this. Uh, you know, the, 
people have been looking, scientists have been looking for life actually for several decades now. Uh, Carl Sagan was one of the leaders in this. There's a, uh, an organization called SETI, uh, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which is now headed by Jill Tarter, used to be headed by Frank Drake. And uh, SETI has been looking for evidence of intelligent life for many, many years now. I, I forget when they started. I think they started back in the 1960s. And most of this is done with ground-based radio telescopes where you're looking for uh, signals that are either beamed to us intentionally from extraterrestrials or preferably to be able to eavesdrop on electromagnetic signals from uh, uh, planets. SETI hasn't found anything in the last four or five decades, maybe not surprisingly, because if there are intelligent beings out there, they're, they're probably not that abundant, and, and so the chances of, of either a civilization beaming us or being close enough for us to eavesdrop on them are not really that great. But you know, why have we been, you know, in a way that's getting the cart ahead of the horse because before you look for intelligent life, you really ought to be looking for life itself. And that's what I want to talk about today. Why haven't we been doing that? Well, it's, it's easier to search for intelligent life be, uh, than it is to search for life because you know, radio telescopes, that technology has been around for 60, 70 years or more, and you can do that from the ground. The, the search for uh, simple life requires large space-based telescopes, which we're only now really able to do. And so that's why this search has gone on sort of in reverse order. Now let me go back to a very famous equation, which is uh, often called the Drake equation. Uh, this is Frank Drake up in the upper left and Carl Sagan in the upper right. The Drake equation, is, uh, Sagan and Drake uh, co-sponsored a meeting back in 1964, I think it was, at, at the Goldstone Radio Telescope Facility in Virginia. Uh, and they, they, the purpose of the meeting was to try to figure out you know, what we knew or what we could know about the number of intelligent civilizations, technical civilizations in the galaxy. So they were interested in this search for intelligent life. Before I uh, go further, I should say I, I knew Carl a little bit and you know, although the, the equation is often called the Drake equation, Sagan sort of co-wrote co it and he co-sponsored the meeting and he did you know, a lot to popularize it through his books, Intelligent Life in the Universe and Cosmos. And so if you were in Carl's presence, this was called the Sagan-Drake equation. Um, the, uh, the terms in the Drake equation, it's, it's, it's not really an equation. It's just a, a series of terms. It's not an equation you can solve. It's a series of terms that uh, Sagan and Drake put together to try to estimate, uh, figure out how you could estimate the number of intelligent civilizations. And so, it, and the number of technical advanced communicating civilizations in the galaxy is the product of NG, the number of stars in the galaxy, FP, the fraction that have planets, and E, the number of Earth-like planets per planetary system, FL, the fraction of those planets on which life evolves, FI, the fraction of those planets on which intelligence evolves, FC, the fraction, the probability that intelligent life will develop into a technical civilization capable of radio communication, because that's how SETI uh, works. And then finally, F, F sub capital L, that's the, the fraction of a planet's lifetime during which it hosts a technical civilization. It could be a very long time or could be very short if technical civilizations destroy themselves in nuclear war or something like that. Now, uh, we don't know what the answer to the Drake equation is. Carl Sagan you know, put, published lots of estimates. You can look in Cosmos, and in Cosmos, I think he estimated that there might be a million intelligent communicating civilizations in the galaxy. Carl was always very much an optimist, and there are other people who think that we might be the only uh, such technical civilization. But that's why if, you, if you're interested in life itself, you can avoid these last three terms, which are really very speculative. In fact, all of these terms, several of them are speculative, but the last ones are the most speculative. And what we, what we want to do with the search for simple life is just find the product of these first four terms, uh, 
you know, ending up with FL, the fraction of planets that, uh, that support life. So that's, a, that's simpler, and hopefully there's a better chance of finding such planets. What do we know? We know, we know some of the terms pretty well already. N sub G, the number of stars in the galaxy, can be observed, basically. You don't count all the stars in the galaxy, but you can do representative star counts by pointing your telescope at some section of the Milky Way and counting the stars there. And the estimates are very large. Some, there's something like 400 billion stars in the galaxy. So that's, of course, a very big number that gets you off to a good start in the Drake equation. And that's why uh, Carl Sagan you know, was able to come up with very optimistic estimates. Uh, so, so Carl was probably right, you know, with all, given all those stars, they're, you know, unless life is a unique uh, event, the origin of life is a unique event that happened only here on Earth, then there must be lots of other uh, planets in the galaxy that support life. As you'll see, though, that's not really the, uh, the most interesting question. FP, the fraction of those stars that host planets, many of us who are optimists like Carl have, have always assumed that uh, most stars have planets, but it wasn't really until the last uh, five or 10 years, Ian, I actually am not sure when this result came out, there was, there was a study done by gravitational microlensing, uh, which I'm not gonna talk about in detail, partly because I'm not expert in it, but also I don't really have time, but microlensing happens when uh, one star passes right in front of a more distant star, and it, the, the closer star, the lensing star, actually bends the light from the uh, more distant star, according to Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity. And if the lensing star has planets around it, the, 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 lens, the, the planets actually affect the shape of the light curve that you get. And so the, the results of this, just, it's just a statistical technique. You can't really see any of those planets, but the results of that uh, support the conclusion that, that there's at least one planet for every star in the galaxy. So if there are 400 billion stars, then there are at least 400 billion planets, and probably a lot more, because most stars, like the sun, probably have more than one planet. So I think we can be optimistic on that term as well. This brings us to the third term, which uh, N sub E, that's the number of Earth-like planets per planetary system. And that's what I'm, I want to spend uh, a fair amount of the, my time tonight talking about. Uh, this is really more relevant to, uh, to the immediate search for, for life. You know, even if there are a million civilizations in the galaxy, if none of them are close enough for us to observe or to talk to, it's, a, it's interesting philosophically, but it's not that interesting scientifically. So what we're interested in scientifically is finding evidence for life, or at least Earth-like planets, around stars that are close enough to the Earth that we can actually observe them with big telescopes and determine you know, what, what, you know, whether there's life on them or whether these planets are at all Earth-like. So that's, that's what this factor N sub E uh, really tells you, uh, tell, you know, something about how many systems out there are like the Earth. Or, or like our own solar system. And then, and then I'm, we're also, of course, interested in the fourth factor, F sub L, which is the, uh, the percentage of those stars, uh, those planets on which life evolves. We can't tell that unless these uh, planets are close enough that we can observe them with big telescopes. All right, so that brings me to uh, the, the question of life. I want to start with that, and then I'll go back to N sub E. Um, as I said earlier, the, the biologists debate amongst themselves what, uh, what a good definition for life is. You know, we, we look around and you know, everything that we can see here on Earth is more or less the same in some respect. We're all based, carbon-based and we all require liquid water and all life on Earth is based on RNA and DNA and proteins and you know, things that the biologists are very uh, familiar with. Life itself may be a more general phenomena, and if you want to be a generalist, uh, one definition that a lot of biologists like, it's here attributed to Jerry Joyce, but uh, it's also sometimes called the NASA d definition of life, is that life is a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. 
Now that's very general, right? That doesn't require that life be carbon-based. It doesn't require that life require liquid water. Uh, this is something that I think all biologists uh, agree with, although I'm always cautious when I say all because there's usually somebody in the audience who who disagree with a, with a statement like that. Um, that's, a, that's a nice definition actually for looking for life within our own solar system because, you know, I'm, I'm uh, an astrobiologist. There's this whole field that NASA has started called astrobiology, which is some combination of astronomy and biology and earth sciences. Uh, and the astrobiology is the search for life off the Earth. Most of astrobiology is actually concerned with searching for life here in our solar system. And you know, there, Mars is one of our nearest neighbors. That's actually probably the planet that's most likely to host life. There's interest also in Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Titan. And so the planetary scientists are interested in building spacecraft to go there. They eventually want to go to Mars and bring back a sample. And you know, if you were able to bring back a sample of uh, the Martian surface that had some kind of microbes in it, you could then study it under the microscope and you might be able to test this definition of life here. But what, you know, as I said, I hang around with astronomers. We're interested in searching for life on planets around other stars. And this definition is just not useful in that sense. So we need something about life that we can look for, but uh, look for remotely. Uh, this is not a, a good remote biosignature. Well, how do we do that? The, the, the basic way to do that has been understood for a long time. You want to uh, analyze a planet spectroscopically. That is, I'll show you a spectrum in a, in a moment. But you want to break down the light from a planet into its characteristic wavelengths and then look for signals of various gases. For example, on the Earth, we know that our, our own atmosphere is rich in oxygen, uh, which of course comes from photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is carried out by trees and grass, but also by uh, single-celled uh, algae and also cyanobacteria, single-celled bacteria that actually invented photosynthesis. So we know that most of the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere came from, comes from life. Uh, there's also a, a certain amount, a smaller amount of methane in the Earth's atmosphere, about 1.6 or 1.7 parts per million of methane. And that methane is also uh, produced almost entirely biologically. It comes from methanogenic bacteria that live in anaerobic environments like the, the uh, flooded soils beneath uh, rice paddies. Cows are another big source of methane because they have methanogens living in their intestines. And so, so uh, it was a famous scientist, uh, James Lovelock, who uh, pointed out many years ago, back in the 1960s, that the simultaneous presence of oxygen and a reduced gas like methane or nitrous oxide, another uh, biological bi uh, biogenic gas, the simultaneous presence of those gases in the Earth's atmosphere is pretty strong evidence for life. And that's, that's still considered sort of the gold standard for uh, searching for life today. Now, uh, I said I, I'll show you one spectrum. Uh, this is a spectrum of the Earth. And you know, this, uh, this idea of searching for life had been around for some time. Carl Sagan actually wrote a paper back in 1993, one of the last papers he wrote before his death where he looked at, uh, took data from the Galileo spacecraft, which was on its way out to Jupiter, but it flew by Earth and took spectra from nearby the Earth. And then he wrote a paper about looking for life with that. But what the astronomers really wanted is they wanted what's called a single pixel resolution spectrum of the Earth. Because if, we, if we're ultimately able to get a spectrum from a, pla a planet around another star, we're, we're not going to get any spatial resolution there. We'll just get one average spectrum over the whole planet. And so the astronomers uh, who were interested in this wanted to get a single pixel resolution spectrum from the Earth. And there were proposals, for instance, to put a telescope at the Earth-Sun L1 Lagrange point uh, between the Earth and the Sun and then point it back at the Earth. You know, orbiting spacecraft are actually too close to do this because you only, you're too close to the Earth and you just see a swath over where you're, you're going. But you know, it would have cost, I think, $30 million to put even a small telescope at L1. 
And some astronomers out at uh, University of Arizona got cleverer than that. They went up on Kitt Peak and pointed their telescope at the dark side of the moon. Now, this is the moon up here when, it, when it's in crescent phase. And you may know that if you go out on a dark night uh, when the moon is in crescent phase like that, you can actually see the dark side of the moon as well as the bright side. Why is that? Well, the bright side, you're seeing the light from the sun that's being reflected off the moon. I think we all know that. But the dark side has a little bit of light coming off it, too. Where is that light coming from? Well, that's light that came from the sun, hit the Earth, bounced off the Earth, hit the moon, and then bounced back to us. And of course, it's much dimmer than the bright side. But there's enough photons there to take a spectrum. And so what these astronomers did is they took a spectrum of the dark side of the moon, and they subtracted out the spectrum of the bright side of the moon. That gets rid of the Earth's spectrum, and then you're left with a spectrum of the Earth. So it's called Earth shine. Right? And that's what this uh, spectrum is here. Now this scale is, uh, these are units that astronomers uh, at least used to love, angstroms. An angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. We use nanometers more frequently these days. So to get you oriented, the visible spectrum, visible light, is between 400 and 700 nanometers, or 4,000 to 7,000 angstroms. So from just beyond the left-hand part of this scale out to about here, this is visible light here. And then beyond 7,000 angstroms, that is called the near-infrared. What you're looking at up here at the top is the Earthshine spectrum of the, of the Earth. That's the black uh, squiggly curve there. So that's measured from the telescope looking up at the dark side of the moon. And then this red curve that goes through the data uh, and is reproduced below is a model fit to the spectrum uh, where these various absorption features of different gases are identified. So if you look, for instance, here in the visible, there's a very broad band right here uh, that's uh, caused by ozone. That's the Chapuis band of ozone. That's not the band. Ozone also absorbs farther into the ultraviolet, and that's what's important in protecting us from sunburn. So the, the ozone layer basically blocks out sh shorter wavelength UV, but it blocks out some of the visible light as well, and you can see that in the Earth spectrum. You can see these, uh, these bands right here, here and here. Three, three bands right here are due to water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. And that, that, of course, is very interesting from the standpoint of habitability because you know, even though we don't know that all life requires liquid water, all life that we know of requires liquid water. And so if you see water vapor in a planet's atmosphere, that's a good suggestion that there's liquid water on the planet's surface. Uh, and so that would be not an indication of life, but a in, 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 potential indication of habitability. But now look right here. There's a very deep uh, feature at 7,600 angstroms, or 760 nanometers. This is just beyond visible light. That's a, a band, an absorption band from uh, molecular oxygen, O2. It's called, called the oxygen A band. You know, and oxygen is what we breathe. It's, uh, you know, as I already mentioned, it's produced by photosynthesis. So if you saw uh, that oxygen A band in a planet's atmosphere, that would be you know, suggestive, at least, of the idea that there might be photosynthetic life on the planet. One thing you don't see in this spectrum is you don't see methane. Methane has absorption bands in this region. It actually it, it absorbs most strongly out in the, in the near infrared and into the farther infrared. It actually absorbs in the visible, too, but it's only present at about 1.6 parts per million, and so the absorption bands are too faint to be seen unless you go to very high spectral resolution. Uh, and so, so we actually probably won't be able, you know, if we were to turn, you know, I'll show you a picture of some telescopes that we might design to look, at, look for this. If you were to turn a big telescope like this on the Earth, you would see oxygen but not methane. And right now, one of the biggest subjects of discussion among the, amongst the astrobiologists is, would that be enough if you just saw oxygen and not methane? Would that be an indication of life? I think in many, uh, many circumstances, it, it would be. All right, so here's uh, what we ultimately want to do, and then, then I'm going to go back to what we're doing today. What we really want to do is build uh, 
a big space-based telescope. And there's different ideas how to do it, actually. The oldest idea is to do this in the, in the far, not in visible wavelengths, but in the, what we call the thermal infrared. Uh, thermal infrared radiation is just heat radiation. So you know, the Earth radiates in the thermal infrared. Objects at room temperature radiate in the thermal infrared. And so they, that's actually a good place to look for planets because they're relatively bright in the thermal infrared compared to their stars, but you need a big telescope. And in fact, you can't do it with a single telescope. You have to fly what's called an interferometer. This is a, a picture of a European space agency mission called Darwin where you would fly four big telescopes uh, that worked in the thermal infrared, and then you combine their beams uh, and use that to effectively get a bigger aperture for your telescope. That's a, that's a really difficult mission because you have to have, you know, and then you have a fifth spacecraft back here to combine the beams and do the interferometry. Now, this is something that the radio, uh, tele, uh, radio telescope scientists have done this for many years on the ground. We have big radio telescope arrays but it's more challenging in the infrared, and it's especially challenging when you go off to space. So, so that, that type of mission will eventually be done, but it probably won't be the first. These other missions, uh, TPFC and TPFO, TPF stands for Terrestrial Planet Finder. So that was what NASA called these big uh, missions up until about 10 years ago. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm talking you, to you tonight is I was uh, very much involved in that effort the TPFC effort. We did a pre-phase A study of TPFC back about 10 years ago, and it carried on for about a year and a half, and then the money was cut off for various reasons. Uh, but what these, these missions do, the C is for coronagraph. A coronagraph gets its name from instruments that are used to look at the sun. And if you block out the disk of the sun, then you can see the very bright corona around, around the sun. So, uh, you can do the same thing with the star. If you bro uh, block out the light from the star, then you can see the reflected light from the much dimmer planets around it. So that's one of the techniques that may be used to, uh, to look for uh, planets around other stars in the future. There's also a, a version of TPF called TPFO. The O stands for a culter here. And if you can see this, here's the space telescope looking at this star back here. There's a, an occulting uh, star shade there in between the planet and the star, and it looks more like a flower than, than like a, a disk, really. It's got, it's got these petals on it. And that technique is actually easy to understand. You, you just block out the light from the star just like I'm blocking out the light from that uh, light up on the ceiling right there. And if you do that at just the right distance with just the size, uh, right size occulter, you can also see the planets around it. So, so that's what we want to do. Uh, these missions are expensive, and I'm going to come back to them at the end because I think they are going to happen, but they're not going to happen uh, that quickly. And, and so I want to talk uh, more about what we're doing right now. Which brings me to part two of the talk. Uh, this is really on the Kepler mission, which is, uh, as I said earlier, is a mission that has been going. It's been up there for five or six years. Uh, and Kepler is designed was designed to measure this parameter called eta sub Earth. Let me define eta sub Earth. Eta sub Earth is the fraction of stars that have at least one rocky planet in their habitable zone. On uh, the habitable zone, as Ian already mentioned, that's what our group works on, and I will, I'll talk a little bit about habitable zones. But that's the region where a planet can support liquid water on its surface. Why is that important? Well, it's because if you want to get a good biosignature from the planet, you, you don't, you know, it's very difficult to do that if you have subsurface microbes. Like Mars may have life in the deep subsurface, but you know, there's probably not enough life there to modify Mars' atmosphere in a way that's easily detectable. With the Earth, <coughs> the life is right here at the surface and it modifies the atmosphere very strongly. So that, we feel, is the best way to be able to look for life on planets around other stars. Also, you know, these are going to be remote biosignatures. And so from my point of view, it pays to be conservative. We want to really start out looking for something li somewhat like ourselves, because, or you know, it's like Earth-like life. 
because otherwise we're very unlikely to be able to interpret that as a, as a real sign of uh, habitation. Now, this, this factor, it's called A to sub Earth, but it's almost the same thing as N sub E, that third factor in the Drake equation that I mentioned earlier. The only difference is that N sub E can be greater than one. In fact, I'll argue in a minute that both Earth and Mars are in the habitable zone today. Mars isn't habitable because it's a small planet and it has lost most of its atmosphere, but if Mars was Earth-sized, it would probably be uh, habitable and so our, our solar system might have two habitable planets instead of just one. Eta sub Earth is defined as a fraction. It's the fraction of stars that have at least one habitable planet. The astronomers like to use that because that's really what they need to know in order to design one of these big telescopes to look for such planets. All right, well, this brings us to Kepler. Uh, here's a picture of the Kepler artist's conception of the Kepler spacecraft. This is a space telescope that was launched in 2009, and it, it operated successfully for four years. In fact, it's, so its main mission ended in 2013. It's still up there flying around. It's in an Earth trailing orbit, so it's not orbiting the Earth. It's orbiting the Sun, but drifting away from the Earth, just sort of following the Earth around in its orbit. Uh, Kepler is a a modest sized telescope. It's got a, a, an aperture of about one meter in diameter. And you know, that's, so that's about yay big. That's smaller than the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Telescope is 2.4 meters in diameter. So Kepler is not as capable as Hubble, but Kepler is capable in one very important way. Kepler is capable of measuring the brightnesses of stars to one part in 10 to the fifth. And so what, uh, what it's looking for is transits of Earth-sized planets. Uh, just one note on that. The reason Ke Kepler's main mission ended two, two years ago is that it has to point very accurately, and it has these reaction wheels that allow it to point, essentially uh, gyroscopes. So it had four of them originally. It has to have three of them working. And by 2013, two of them had died. So Kepler now can't point accurately enough to really do its main thing. What Kepler is looking for is transits. A transit is when a planet passes in front of the star. And you know, some of you may have seen uh, Mercury transits the sun uh, fairly regularly, so you can see transits of Mercury from the Earth. Two years ago, I think it was, uh, Venus transited the sun. And uh, Venus transits only twice every 100 years or so. So this was actually a very rare event. But when a, when a planet you know, transits, moves in front of the star, it blocks out a little bit of the starlight. Uh, and the, the amount that it blocks out depends on the ratio of the planet's size to the star's size. So let's think about how this works. If, if you have a big planet like Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is about 10 times the diameter of the Earth, and the Sun is about 10 times the diameter of Jupiter. Right? So if Jupiter passes in front of a star like the Sun, then the, the area of the planet is pi r squared, where r is the radius. And so since Jupiter is 10% of the radius of the Sun, then the, its area is 1% 1 per, 1 of the area of the Sun. So if a Jupiter-sized planet goes in front of a sun-like star, it blocks out 1% of the star's light. That's very easy to see. In fact, that can be seen from ground-based telescopes. And you know, it's a piece of cake for Kepler. The Earth is much smaller. Earth is 10 times smaller than Jupiter, so 1% of the sun's diameter or radius, and therefore the area of the Earth is one part in 10 to the fourth of the sun's area. So it you know, produces a dip in the sun's brightness or the star's brightness by one part in 10 to the fourth. That's what Kepler was designed to do because Kepler can measure a dip of one part in 10 to the fifth. Right? So the, the idea then is for Kepler stared at a uh, patch of the Milky Way. In fact, I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is that not every planet is going to transit its star as seen from Earth. Right? So if if the star is right here and the planet is going around in an orbit like this, then you all would see it transit if you're sitting right in the, right, in the plane of the orbit. But if the star is here and the planet is going around it like this, then nobody's going to see a transit because it never passes in front. 
it's, it's actually very easy to calculate the probability of seeing a transit. It's just the radius of the star divided by the radius of the planet's orbit. And for Earth, you know, if you take the radius of the sun divided by the radius of Earth's orbit, that turns out to be one half of 1%, uh, which is a low number, right? So that we think that you know, planet, the, the planes of orbits of planets are randomly oriented uh, in space. So if you wanted to see the Earth, you know, the Earth around the sun, you'd have to look at roughly 200 sun-like stars to get a, even if each one of them has an Earth, that will give you then a statistical probability of seeing one planet. So that's why Kepler had to monitor so many stars. It looked at 160,000 stars simultaneously for four years uh, you know, on the small chance that uh, some of them will have transiting planets the size of the Earth. This is actually the Kepler field for that main mission. Here's the Milky Way running through the sky right here. Kepler didn't look right in the Milky Way because the stars are actually too crowded there, and there's also dust lanes in there, so there's things that interfere with the observations. So what Kepler did is it looked just off the main plane of the Milky Way and just sat there and stared at that patch of sky for four years in a row. You, you need, it's a good thing it worked for four years because with these transits, all they do is they provide a little blip, you know, a little decrease in the star's brightness. You can't tell from one such blip that, the, that there's a planet there. In fact, even two blips is not enough. But if you get three or more blips that, that, have, that are equally spaced, then you start to think that there's a planet. And so, you know, for a planet like the Earth that has a one-year orbital period, you would need at least three years of data to be able to find the Earth, right? So we, Kepler basically lasted just long enough to find planets like the Earth. Now, I, I'm just going to show you a couple slides that sort of summarize the Kepler data. They're not quite up to date, and that's because the Kepler team keeps uh, redoing their analyses. This is a, an analysis that came out two years after Kepler launched. And what they're doing is they, they saw lots of planets already, you know, halfway through the mission. Here's the total number of planet candidates that they uh, saw by that time. They call them planet candidates rather than planets because they like to verify these things by other techniques before they're really happy with calling them planets. But most of these are probably real planets. What you see, you don't just see planets the size of the Earth, you see planets of all different sizes. And so here's the size category of planets. There's Earth-sized. They're, they're categorized in, in terms of their radius compared to Earth. So for planets that are less than 1.25 times the Earth radius, those are classified as Earth-sized, and Kepler had by this time found 207 of them. Uh, there are super-Earths, which were uh, planets between 1.25 and 2 Earth radii. A super-Earth is a, a planet that's bigger than Earth, but is still thought to have a rocky surface and, uh, and an atmosphere. Whereas when you get up to Neptune-sized planets, that's a planet like Neptune or Uranus in our own solar system, those planets don't have any solid surfaces. And so actually one of the things that I think all the astrobiologists agree on is that if you're going to look for life, you want to look on rocky planets because if you have a gas giant like Neptune or a bigger gas giant uh, like Jupiter or Saturn, which doesn't have a solid surface, then there's no stable pressure temperature environment there for life to originate in. And so it's very unlikely, uh, in my view, and I think in most astrobiologists' view, that there's life on uh, giant planets. So there are, uh, as I said, there's actually lots of Neptune-sized planets between two and six Earth radii that have been seen 1,100 or so. Neptune itself is about four Earth radii. It's right in the middle of that range. There's fewer Jupiter-sized planets. Uh, Jupiter, is, as I've already said, is 10 Earth radii. So these ones between 6 and 15 Earth radii are classified as Jupiter-sized. And then there's a few very super Jupiters, uh, planets that are bigger than Jupiter. Now, one thing that uh, I'll point out here uh, in the bottom is that the definition of what's a super-Earth and what's a sub-Neptune has changed just within the last year or two. We used to think, based on theory, that uh, you know, planets up to about two Earth radii would be rocky. And that's because the volume of a planet goes as the radius cubed, so 
the volume would be eight times, of a two Earth radii planet would be eight times that of Earth, and the mass would be more like nine or ten times that of Earth. And uh, astrophysical theory had predicted that planets smaller than ten Earth masses would, would uh, remain rocky, and planets bigger than that would start capturing too much gas and dust from the stellar nebula and turn into gas giants. Well, now analysis of uh, a number of these planets from Kepler uh, by other techniques, you can then, you know, you can look, use what's called the radial velocity or Doppler method, and you look at the, the pull of the planet on the, on the star, and it, the star wobbles back and forth in your line of sight. So if you have a transit observation that gives you the size and a radial velocity observation that gives you the mass, then you can figure out the density of the planet. And what's been found, this is something we couldn't do until we had the Kepler data, but now that you know, we've done RV measurements on a number of these Kepler uh, planets, and it, it turns out that it looks like the boundary between rocky planets and uh, gas giants is more like at about one, one and a half Earth radii instead of two. So that's one of the reasons why the, the published estimates are, are all immediately out of date, because they're based on something that turns out to be wrong. Now here's a slightly more up-to-date uh, view of the planet's uh, size distribution. This is still from two years ago. The same size categories here, and now this is a, co a more colorful slide. So here's the Earth-sized planets, super-Earths, Nept uh, Neptune-sized, Jupiter-sized, and super-Jupiters. And if you look at this, take these data at face value, it looks like most of the planets out there are Neptune-sized, and then there's fewer on either side. But you have to think about w w whether that's what's real in there and what's, what's an artifact or a selection effect. On this side here, the, uh, the fact that there's fewer Jupiters and super-Jupiters, that's, that's almost certainly real, because those big planets are easier to see than the smaller ones, and so they, they, they're a piece of cake for Kepler to detect. But if you go on the other side here, the super-Earths and the Earths, now you're getting down into the region where the planets are more difficult to detect. In fact, something I didn't mention about Kepler is that one, one thing we learned uh, from Kepler is that the Sun is not a, an ordinary G star. The Sun, you know, we think of it as an ordinary star. It's a G star. That's one of the uh, classification schemes uh, based on its mass. It's a, a main sequence star. But it turns out, we learned from Kepler, that most uh, G stars like the Sun have more sunspots than the Sun. And sunspots are a problem for planet detection because, you know, they're actually, they, you'd think they were dimmer, but they're surrounded by bright areas, so they're a little brighter. And when the star rotates, that, that, those uh, sunspots go around and that creates noise in the data. And so it, it's actually proven more difficult for Kepler to find the Earth-sized planets than anticipated because we didn't know that all these sun-like stars actually had all those sunspots. Uh, and so, so the bottom line is that uh, you know, there may be just as many Earth-sized and super-Earth-sized uh, planets as there are Neptune-sized, but it's difficult to pull that directly out of the data. You can only do that by statistical analysis and making good guesses as to what's happening with stellar activity, the sunspot cycles. Okay, so then uh, that actually brings me to the that's the part that, that we don't work on ourselves. The part that we do work on ourselves is the habitable zones, which Ian mentioned in the beginning. You know, we're not, we're not, most of those planets that Kepler has seen, uh, some of them are Earth-sized and super-Earths. Most of those are not potentially habitable because they're not at the right distance from their star. And you know, as I said earlier, what we really want, we want planets that can maintain liquid water on their surfaces well, for that to be the case, then you need to be at roughly the right distance. So here's a, an old picture of the habitable zone. Is the habitable zone is this blue strip here. The vertical axis is uh, stellar mass relative to the, to the sun. So the sun is a G star here. It's at a relative mass of one. And here's the, uh, at, the, at the time this slide was made, there were nine planets in the solar system. You have to update it now, right, because Pluto is no longer a planet. So there's eight planets in the solar system. Uh, Earth is the third rock from the sun, so Earth is sitting here. Looks like it's comfortably in the middle of the habitable zone. Venus is just inside the habitable zone, and Mars in this diagram is just outside the habitable zone. The, these uh, other types of stars, as you go up here to more massive stars, those are the bright blue stars, 
They're much more luminous than the sun, and so the habitable zone is farther away. These stars that are less massive than the sun are red dwarfs, and they're much less luminous than the sun, so the habitable zone moves in here. Now, one problem with this is that the habitable zone doesn't just stay fixed in space because all stars brighten as they age. And this is something that's sort of counterintuitive. The stars, main sequence stars like the sun, are burning, they're fusing hydrogen into helium, and so they're becoming more helium rich in their interiors. You would think that as they run out of hydrogen, they would get dimmer and eventually go out, but that's not what happens. Stars actually get brighter as they age because the core becomes more helium rich and it contracts and gets hotter, and so the fusion reactions speed up. So this, is, this was the habitable zone when the solar system formed, and that habitable zone is now drifting farther out, and the Earth is actually closer to the in, inside edge of the habitable zone than it was when the solar system formed. Now, you can, uh, if you want to get rid of that time dependence, you can graph the habitable zone a different way here. So in this case, we've got stellar temperature on the vertical axis. These are the more massive stars are also hotter, so they're up at the top. And instead of putting, putting distance, I actually failed to mention here, this uh, scale on the, the, the x-axis is the, the distance of the planet from the sun in astronomical units, one astronomical unit being the Earth-Sun distance, right? So the Earth is at one there. Now, in, the, in these uh, newer slides that we've been making, newer figures on the habitable zone, we plot the habitable zone in terms of the amount of starlight that is incident on the planet's surface. And again, if here's, here's the Earth right here. So the Earth gets 100% of its uh, sunlight, and the, su the temperature of the sun is about 5,800 kelvins. So here's Earth, and here's Mars, and here's Venus. If you look at the, the graph this way, Mars is actually within the habitable zone, and Venus is just inside it. So that's why I said earlier that N sub E for our own solar system might actually be two if you, because both Earth and Mars are potentially habitable. Now there's, there's actually more curves on here than you would expect, and that's because we don't really understand where the habitable zone is, even though we work on it hard. We're theoreticians, we do this with climate models, but we don't exactly trust our climate models because you're trying to model runaway greenhouse atmospheres on the inner edge where the oceans evaporate and turn into steam atmospheres and these very dense CO2 rich atmospheres on the outer edge. And we're using climate models that are adapted from models to study the Earth. And there's actually lots of uncertainties in those climate models. Some of you, you know, if you follow the global warming debate, you know that clouds are a big problem even for just doubling CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, and so we don't really know what clouds do, especially on the inner edge of the habitable zone. So we, what we do is we define a conservative habitable zone here, uh, which goes from this yellow curve to the blue curve. The, the yellow is where our climate models develop runaway greenhouse atmospheres where the oceans evaporate. And then we define a more optimistic habitable zone, which is based just uh, empirically. It's, we, we say Venus defines an inner limit on the habitable zone because Venus doesn't have water today and actually it has no evidence of having had water for at least a billion years. So we're pretty sure that planet, and there is evidence, which I haven't talked about, that Venus did have water at one point. But so, so that's an empirical inner edge for the habitable zone. So there's an optimistic habitable zone and a conservative habitable zone. And what we tell the astronomers, uh, try to convince them, is that we want to be conservative when we're uh, calculating ATIS of Earth, because we want to use that parameter to basically design the telescope that you need to find these Earth-like planets. And if, you, if you're too optimistic in your estimate, then your telescope that you design will be too, might be too small. And we don't want that to happen. So we want to try to be conservative or pessimistic in our estimates. All right, so what have people done with this? Uh, people have been uh, using the Kepler data and publishing estimates of Ada of Earth. Here's a paper that came out uh, a year and a half ago now by uh, Pettigura et al. So what they are plotting here, they're, they're using the Kepler data. They're plotting planet size on the uh, vertical axis here. Remember, this was done back when two Earth radii was uh, considered the upper limit for a rocky planet. 
and this is stellar light intensity in Earth uh, units, this green area out there is the habitable zone that they used in their paper, which uh, we actually don't think is the right habitable zone. So we, we think that our conservative habitable zone looks more like this. If you take their habitable zone, you can see there were eight or 10 planets that were in it, most of them being in the inner parts and not very many in the outer parts. Uh, in, in our conservative habitable zone, at this time, there was only one Earth-like planet in it. And so you get, you know, this is why these ed estimates that have been published for Eta sub Earth are rather uncertain. So uh, Pettigura et al. got 0.22, but you know, we immediately divided their estimate by a factor of two, but you don't really know. And then the, you know, the size of the planets has changed. There are other published estimates for Eta sub Earth for these M stars, the red dwarfs, which are much higher than that. They're between 0.4 and 0.6. But most of those estimates were done back when we ta thought two Earth radii was the upper limit for rocky planets. So the bottom line actually is that you should uh, stay tuned because this whole thing is changing. This was a slide that was a, in a press release from the, the American Astronomical Society meeting this past January, and they were announcing eight new planets in the habitable zone, in the concert. So this uh, is now. These uh, blue planets are, were previously published planets. The yellow ones were new planets that had just been identified. And these green areas were, are the conservative and uh, optimistic habitable zones from our models. So actually, you know, I'm still optimistic that when, when the Kepler team gets done with their analysis, Eta sub Earth is going to go back up again. We think it's at least a tenth, and it may be considerably higher than that. But we don't know the final answer. All right, so that brings me to the last part here, and I'll be quick here. I just want to show you what, what's going to happen in the near-term future and beyond, which I've already talked about a little bit. Uh, just a point that Kepler uh, target stars are not close. They're, you know, you're looking at this patch of the Milky Way there. The average distance to a Kepler target star is 600 light years or greater. And so those are not the stars that we can follow up with, uh, with planet observations. And so as the slide says, you know, we can speculate till we're blue in the face about whether those planets are inhabited, but you can't check them out directly. So what we need to do is we want to find planets around more nearby stars that we can follow up on. And NASA has uh, lots of plans to do that. In 2017, uh, they're going to fly a mission called TESS the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And this is a mission somewhat like Kepler. It's going to look for transits of planets around stars, except you know, Kepler looked at a particular patch of the Milky Way and at stars that were fairly distant and not very bright. TESS is going to look at more nearby stars that are brighter. And so TESS is going to try to find transiting stars or uh, transiting planets around nearby bright stars. Why did TESS get funded? It's because uh, a year after that, in 2018, there's going to be an absolutely huge space telescope that is being launched. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a, here's a picture of it right here. This is a six and a half meter telescope, so you know most of the size of this room, uh, half the size of this room, and uh, that one is you know going to be able to do very much better. Uh, spectra of these planets. One thing I didn't talk about is that you can actually get spectra of transiting planets. Uh, if a planet passes in front of a star, some of the starlight passes through the planet's atmosphere, and you can get what's called a transit spectrum. That's very different from what I was talking about earlier, where you get reflected st starlight from the planet, and you, in that case, you need a coronagraph. JWST will not have a coronagraph, so it can't see planets beside their star, but it can see planets as they pass in front of their star. And because it's so big, they can actually get a pretty good transit spectrum. And so JWST will clean up on Jupiter-sized planets, especially ones that are close to their stars. It may just be able to, to get a transit spectrum of an Earth-sized planet around a, a red dwarf, an M star. And so, you know. Hold your breath for the next uh, th three, three or four years or so. Is that there's a possibility that JWST could find evidence for life within the next, say, four or five years. But it's not that great of a possibility because it's just on the edge of what JWST can do. What we uh, 
really want to do, well, uh, uh, too fast. There's another telescope coming up right after that, uh, 2024. It's called WFIRST AFTA. It's a very confusing acronym. This is really a cosmology mission. WFIRST is the Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope, and they're looking at the, find, trying to pin down the Big Bang a little better. They, they're looking at the expansion of the universe. But they've, they've put uh, two instruments on it that, that can help out with exoplanets. One thing, they're going to do more gravitational microlensing, which I mentioned at the beginning, which gives you statistical evidence for planets. But there are also now plans to put a pretty good coronagraph on WFIRST. So that will allow this telescope to block out the light from the star and look for the reflected light from the planets. That, that process is called direct imaging. So that's, that's you know, what the, the big TPF telescope should be able to do. WFIRST will be able to do it. JWST can't do that because it doesn't have a coronagraph. Right? And this, this uh, telescope, the reason that's going, it's the same size as the Hubble. So it's not what the astronomers really want to fly. But NASA was given this telescope by the National Reconnaissance Organization, which is the US spy agency. And so this telescope was actually designed to look down at the Earth rather than up at space. But uh, NRO didn't need it anymore. In fact, they had two such telescopes, and they just gave them to NASA. These are billion-dollar telescopes. And so NASA is figuring out ways to put those to a more productive use. Then finally, uh, it's my last side, what, what we ultimately want to do is uh, what I talked about at the beginning of the talk. We want to build a bigger direct imaging telescope, which used to be called Terrestrial Planet Finder. But if, if you've ever worked for an agency like NASA, you'll know that it's impossible to get new money for old ideas. And so this telescope keeps get, getting renamed. It was called, uh, it's, it's Space Telescope Institute is called At Last uh, in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Decadal Survey, it was called NWO, the New World's Observer. And I've seen a new uh, acronym, the HDST, the High Definition Space Telescope. This would be one of these big telescopes that uh, does everything, right? Eight me probably eight meters or so in diameter with a good coronagraph for a star shade. And, and so that's what uh, ultimately will allow us to both find and characterize Earth. And if with luck, that could fly by probably the early 2030s. So that brings me to the end here. And let me just leave you with uh, three thoughts. First of all, that uh, as I said at the outset, searching for intelligent life is the ultimate goal. Uh, but uh, you know, we want to take our baby steps first. And uh, so searching for life itself should be done before that. Second, uh, the Kepler data set, uh, even though Kepler has somewhat limited capabilities. It has just been a, a real gold mine for us. And before Kepler, we didn't really know that there were lots of Earth-like planets around other stars. We just speculated that there might be. But now we're, we're fairly confident that that's the case. And then the, the last part is what I just said. Ultimately, the goal is to build a, a very big space telescope that can both find these Earth-like planets directly and take spectra of their atmospheres. And when we do that, we have at least a chance of answering this question of are we, are we the only living uh, organisms in the universe? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your talk. It was uh, very interesting. Um, you said that um, it's much easier to detect, even from Earth, Jupiter-sized planets. And then now, those planets have 5, 10, 50 moons orbiting around them. So uh, what do you think uh, there's the trade-offs between looking for small Earth-sized planets versus looking for the moons, potentially habitable moons, of the gas giants? And then does the concept of the habitable zone for the gas giant moons exist? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. People have thought of that. And uh, there's sort of two ways to answer it. One is that you actually can find evidence for moons around some of these big planets. That can be done with, uh, with Kepler, actually. Because when you have a moon, if you have a giant planet like Jupiter going around a star, and that's being orbited by, the moon, by its moon, then the moon is tugging on the planet. And it actually causes the transits to be not quite equally spaced. They're off just by a little bit, because the planet is wobbling in its orbit. The technique is called transit timing variations. And 
Ian, maybe you know better than I. I know that uh, at least some giant planet moons have been found. <laughs> Nominally. Yeah. Nominally, so it's difficult. The, the bad news is that it's actually difficult to follow up on that because think about direct imaging. Uh, you know, I talked a little bit about that. You, you, we're, you want to see a very dim planet next to a very bright star. So you work very hard to block out the bright star and then you're left with the light from the dim planet. Well, if you have a moon going around that dim planet, that's much dimmer than the planet. So how do you get a spectrum of that? You can't simultaneously block out the star and then block out the planet and get the moon. So the best you're going to be able to do, I think, is, is maybe get transit spectra of the moon around the planet. And that's a, you know, a very faint signal, which ultimately you may be able to do that, but it's, it's actually much more difficult than getting planet spectra themselves. Next one. Yes, the Rosetta mission, uh, there are any suggestions of life from this mission? And, uh, and I need to ask also about uh, the holes, the black holes. Is there any possibility of life on black holes? Black holes? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. No. <laughs> uh, black holes are uh, not very good places in spite of the, uh, what's the movie that uh, just, Interstellar, right? How many people have seen Interstellar? You know, if you're a sci-fi fan, you have to go see it. You know, it, they make a really stupid choice, in my opinion, in that uh, movie that <laughs> They've got two, a choice between two planets to observe. They've only got enough fuel to go to one. And one is a planet orbiting a normal star, and one is a planet orbiting a black hole. So which one do they choose? The one orbiting the black hole. You know, that way they get to get a lot of relativity into the uh, film. So, so I don't think bl black holes don't, don't put out visible radiation. There's lots of high energy particles and things that are coming out that would be actually very inimical to, to life. Now, the, uh, your other question was on Rosetta, I think. Rosetta, some of you may know, this is this European Space Agency uh, mission to a comet. And Rosetta uh, rendezvoused with the comet, I think, a month and a half or two months ago. It first went into a sort of orbit around the comet, and then it landed on the comet. But it didn't land very well. If you followed that, it, it was supposed to land and then send out a grappling hook and stick, stick to where it landed. Instead, the grappling hook, for one reason or another, didn't work, and the thing bounced when it hit. Comets are not very big, so they don't have much gravity. So the thing bounced uh, a half a, well, a kilometer or so up into, the, uh, into space, and it came back down again about an hour or two later, and it came back down in a valley facing the wrong way so that the solar panels were not seeing the sun. And Rosetta, it still was able to get some data on the comet, nothing that indicates life. In fact, you wouldn't expect life on a comet because there's no atmosphere, really no liquid water. Nevertheless, it's a fascinating mission. And what, what comets, they do, they, they have a role for life because some people, they're very rich in organic molecules and water. And so one theory of you know, the origin of water and or organic uh, carbon on Earth is that a lot of that came in in comets. So that's why the interest in objects like that Rosetta, uh, the comet that Rosetta is studying. So based on the Kepler data, can we actually estimate the false negative rate and update the Sagan Drake equation? Like how many, based on the, the data it's said? The, on so. the, the fraction of stars that have planets? Yes. So um, I don't think it's that easy to do from, from Kepler because you're looking only at the transiting planets, right? So you can, you can make an estimate uh, of F sub P. I haven't actually seen anything published on that. You remember that you know, when you're looking at sun-like stars, only one in 200 of them are going to show evidence for a planet. So you then have to, you know, invert the statistics there and multiply the number that you see by 200 for the sun, for just for the Earth-like planets. So it's not really a very, the, the right, I think the microlensing works best for getting, getting the, uh, fra the fraction of uh, F sub P. Thank you for your uh, interesting lecture. <clears throat> Sir, uh, I want to ask you one question. Can you give a definition about the life in Earth? About life itself? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, I, I gave you a definition, that, you know, the, the, the one the biologists like, that it's a self-replicating chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. But then I argued that that's not a useful definition for astronomers. So my own suspicion is that life, that there is life out there, and that it's basically like, our, like us in, in a lot of ways. So I, I would be, wager a lot of money that, that life out there is going to be carbon-based. Because carbon you know, forms long chain molecules much easier than other uh, atoms do, other elements. Silicon is right below carbon in the periodic table. And science fiction authors have often speculated that you could have silicon-based life. But silicon combines very strongly with oxygen. And it forms things we call rocks. And uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult. You know, it's such a strong bond that it's really difficult to see how you're going to get something complicated out of it. So I'd, I'd bet a lot of money that, that other alien life, extraterrestrial life, is carbon-based. I'd bet a smaller amount of money that it will also require liquid water, like uh, life does on Earth. You know, uh, there are organisms on Earth that don't need liquid water all the time. For instance, uh, organisms that form spores. And that actually, you, in Abu Dhabi, you probably know more about this than I do, because you live in the desert area, and there's things that grow in the desert, you know, even though it only rains once in however many years, right? So, so life on Earth can survive for, some forms of life on Earth can survive for long time periods without water, but then it needs, they need water in order to reproduce and metabolize. Um, and then, you know, there's good chemical reasons for that, actually. Water is a very polar molecule. The, the charge distribution is, you know, the electrons are concentrated up by the oxygen, and the hydrogen end is uh, positively charged. So that gives you what's called an electric dipole moment. And that, then if you're trying to form you know, complicated polar compounds, like the ones that form our RNA and DNA and proteins, they, they dissolve better in a very highly polar liquid. Water is also, you know, it's probably very common, because oxygen is, I think, the third most abundant element in the universe after hydrogen and helium. And hydrogen's the most abundant, so H2O, the combination of hydrogen and oxygen, we think is going to be almost everywhere. Right? Then, then you get into more complicated questions, is will life somewhere else be based on molecules like RNA and DNA? And this is where the biologists really get, uh, you know, get, I'm not a good enough biologist to give a, a well-informed opinion on that. But you have to have some, in, in order to have replication and mutation and Darwinian evolution, you have to have some way of storing a genetic code and, and then you know, mutating that and replicating it very accurately. And so if you, if, if you don't have RNA and DNA, there must be molecules that are very similar that, to those that would be involved in any form of life that I can imagine. I, uh, OK. Uh, Let's assume we are successful and we find you know uh, Earth-like you know planet somewhere, and uh, with life. So what next? Are we going to communicate with these people? So what? What? What's the purpose now? Because there is no way we could reach these people. Well, you're you're back to where I started, right? That's so they, there will be trillion and trillion of kilometers to reach these people. So what? What we? Well, we're all interested in intelligent life, right? So that's, that's where this all started out uh, many years ago. If we were to find intelligent life, we, we might be able to communicate with it. But you know, it depends what distance. If it was in the immediate solar neighborhood, you might be able, let's say you found life on a planet that was 50 light years away, you could have a very slow conversation, right? That, <laughs> so every 100 years, you'd get an answer. Uh, and you know, they, they actually, the chances of there being an intelligent civilization within 50 light years, even Carl Sagan didn't think that that was the case. He thought the closest one would be about 250 light years, being very optimistic. So, so yes, we might eventually talk with aliens, but uh, unless we figure out how to go faster than the speed of light, it's going to be a slow conversation.